Hey everybody, it's 9 o'clock and 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner. We are in the Friday of the second week of Easter. Our text today is taken from John chapter 6 verses 1 to 15. It's a very long text for me to read because of my facial palsy. So I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to ask you to please read it. Also, if you'd like to, um, to reflect on the first reading taken from Acts chapter 5 verse 34 to 42, just go to the description box. There's a link to the video as well as the text format of this teaching. Uh, but I'm going to focus on John chapter 6. Please read it. Pause your video. Read the text. It's about the feeding of the 5,000. And many of you will say, I know that one, so I don't need to read it. Big mistake. You need to keep your Bible open for this teaching. because, And I'm suggesting you keep your Bible open for this teaching because you'll need uh, to refer constantly. I'm going to give you a completely new perspective. So I've entitled today's teaching, Be the Sign not the sigh. Be the sign, not the sigh. Now, straight away, each of the four Gospels mention the multiplication of the loaves and they narrate it. Um, so they narrate the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. And um, if you look at the synoptics, the synoptics are Matthew, Mark and Luke comes from the word to see together. That's why they're similar. So we call Matthew, Mark and Luke the synoptics. So while the synoptic Gospels tell it literally as a miracle story, the Gospel of John wraps it up in greater theological meaning. That's why I said open your Bibles. So you need to know this and I, for those of you who are familiar with my teachings, I've thought this before. The Gospel of John is the only Gospel that tells us of this miracle as a, as a sign, not as a miracle. Remember that the Gospel of John has signs and not miracles. So it tells us this as a sign um, that takes place close to the celebration of the Passover and that Jesus leads the people not into a deserted place as the synoptics put it but this time Jesus will take them up a mountain and you'll see why John does that. So why would John give us these details if not to as it were pique our interest? Why up a mountain not in a deserted place and then you want to see what John really wants to communicate. So in order to understand today's text, you need to read the closing verse of the previous chapter, which is chapter 5, verse 39 to 47. And please read it and then read chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. So Jesus in um, chapter 5, verse 39 to 47, he gets into a verbal argument, a verbal spat with the Jewish religious leaders. He pointedly accuses them of a failure to see in the scriptures that they read every day, the very message pertaining to himself as being the one who is the source of life. And he clearly tells the Jewish establishment that they do not have the love of God in them and that it is Moses, Moses whom they revere, it will be Moses who will be their accuser. Let me read this in chapter 5 verse 45. Uh, 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom you have set your hope. And it is here that our text begins with these little clues. So the very word Moses would jog one's mind to the Passover and now St. John tells us that the Passover is close at hand. So you see John is not giving you a chronological order of events but he's giving you a theological presentation. He brings Moses, you're thinking of the Passover, you're thinking of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, St. John's Gospel, if you read it, has seven signs, not seven miracles. A sign always points to a greater reality. And so, in the feeding of the 5,000, we are called not to see the miracle, but we are called to see the sign. What is there for the greater reality? That's why I said, do not read you might say, I know the story of the multiplication of the fish and loaves. It is not as it seems in the Gospel of John. The purpose of presenting it is completely different. So the focus, therefore, is not on the multiplication in itself, but it is on the person of Jesus who is responsible for it and on his divine nature. So Jesus, therefore, is presented. Watch now, because he's talking about Moses. In the multiplication of the five loaves and the fish, 
Jesus is presented as the new Moses. So I want to show you the similarities and the comparisons in this text. Okay, Moses, you know, the first, Moses went up a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments and he went alone. Look at John's Gospel. Jesus also goes up the mountain but he takes his disciples and then a whole crowd follows him and then you have the multiplication uh, narrative. Second, while Moses parted the Red Sea in a spiritual act, Jesus feeds the 5,000 via a spiritual grace or a supernatural grace. Number three, Jesus tests the disciples in today's Gospel. We read this in John, look at your Bibles if it's open, it should be John chapter 6. He said this to test them. Test whom? Test him. Test whom? Test Philip. Because in verse 7, Philip answers. So in Exodus chapter 16 verse 4, God tells Moses that he will rain bread from heaven for you each day. And the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And God says this. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. So in both the feeding of the 5,000 with Moses, there is a testing. See the similarities here. Yeah? Number four, the fourth similarity. In the Gospel of John, Jesus asked the disciples to collect the scraps. Now go to Exodus chapter 16 verse 19. Yeah, It is referring to the scraps. Moses says to the people, let no one leave any of it over until morning. The fifth similarity. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 6, verse 41, the Jews begin to complain. So further down in this text, in verse 41, the Jews begin to complain about Jesus because he said that he was the bread that came down from heaven. And we are all familiar with the grumblings also of the Israelites in the wilderness against Moses. So the people of Israel are grumbling against Moses. The Pharisees, the scribes are grumbling against Jesus. And the last similarity that you will see is Moses was asked to provide for the people in the book of Exodus. But now Jesus was the provider for his people. No longer does God need anybody else because God himself is providing. Now, St. John in highlighting these very subtle comparisons and connections is making just one point. What is it? Jesus is the new Moses. And if the Jewish authorities, as he says in chapter 5, verse 39, if you really knew your scriptures, they and they really believed Moses, they would have also believed Jesus. For Moses wrote about Jesus. Read chapter 5, verse 46. Very clearly he said, If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? In short, Jesus says, You have never read his works, you have never believed what he said therefore when i do all these miracles that can show you exactly uh, the similarities between me and moses you will reject even that yet my dear friends while the religious leaders could not see the truth who sees the truth it is the people who saw the sign we know this in uh, chapter 6 verse 14 they saw the sign they, they joined all the dots together and they made the connections and they remembered Moses who fed the people in the wilderness just as Jesus did. So we are told in scripture that they begin to say, this indeed is, watch what they call him, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. And then um, at the end of it, the scripture tells us that they wanted to take him by force. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, verse 15 of chapter 6. Um, while this, uh, he, he went away from them. You know, sadly, while they stood ahead above in their recognition of who Jesus was, sadly, the people were enamored by the bread they ate and they failed to see the meaning of the sign that Jesus was greater than Moses and that he is God. And sadly, perhaps we too see only the signs in our life and we fail to see the God behind our blessings. So my dear friends, while we have a clear understanding into the deeper theological meaning of what the Gospel of John intended to convey, there's also something that we can take away pastorally and practically. And I want to focus on just one takeaway. I always like that you leave with one thought, not just, you know, a lot of intellectual thinking. Some of you may like these videos because I give you new scriptural insights like I've done today. 
some of you also need something to fill your soul in a very simple way so this is what I want to leave you with you know when faced with a challenge Philip and Andrew both what did they do oh how are we going to feed all these people they threw their hands up in this despair why because both Philip and Andrew say saw rather a problem they saw a problem now what does Philip do Philip does a mathematical calculation to arrive at the fact that even the six months of financial reserves that they had tucked under their belt would barely buy each one a small piece of bread let alone where they would get it from because they, they were up on a mountain where are they going to go there were no shops but Philip is so smart he's done a calculation and he says six months of what we have divided by so many people everybody's going to get a small piece Andrew, while identifying a little boy with five barley loaves and two fish, throws up his hands also in despair. Yeah, what do we have? Oh, we got just five barley loaves, two fish, what are we going to do? So Philip and Andrew see a problem. What does Jesus see? He sees a hungry crowd that needs to be fed. You know, I want to say this with great regret. And I say this with great regret. The church too has come to respond to the poverty and hunger around us the same way that Philip and Andrew did, that it is a problem. Make no mistake, while we cannot er eradicate world poverty, we can make a difference to one person's life. And that begins when we stop throwing our hands up while we sigh rather than lend our hands to bringing about a smile. Here I want to talk about Lenny and Nadia Soares. This is one of the organizations I support. A lay couple, two children of their own, decide to open a house, not an orphanage, but a home for children. Children who would never stand a chance in the real world, bring them up, look after them. They, they don't stand and say, oh, what are we going to do? I know today parents, and with no disrespect to anybody, but couples today say, oh, we can't handle one child. And here we have some 12, 13 children in the home being looked after, being loved, being cared for. Thanks to also your kind donations. And I hope you would be kinder after this teaching and not throw your hands up, but give whatever you can. But this is the attitude we need to have. We can't just be throwing our hands up every time, you know, we say, oh, I can't deal with this. No, we have to find a solution. And sadly, too much of this is going on in the church. Having said that, I want to say a word of great appreciation to Bishop Percival Fernandez, now I think in his early 80s or mid 80s, who stays at Gorigaon Seminary. You know, many years ago, and I, I want to share this with you, those of you in the Bombay Diocese, you need to know this. Those in other dioceses, you need to learn from what he has done. Bishop Percy was at St. John's Medical. I think he was the administrative director of the entire medical college for many years. He came back, he was made auxiliary bishop. One of the things he did was to set up a fund. You know, he noticed that Catholics are running around in Bombay when they need medical assistance to Mount Mary's, to Mahim Church, and then you go to the parish priest, he gives you letters, you go to 10 other parishes, you get some little money here, little money there. And he said, why are we making our Catholics run all over? And single-handedly, he does all his administrative work himself. He washes his own car. He writes his own letters. He wrote thousands of letters to people in Bombay saying, I want to start a fund. He has collected a sizable amount of money. And I want to tell you how it works, because I think this is the best kept secret. I must write an article. Yeah, so many lay people in Bombay do not have an idea about this. The fund is a very simple thing. You have a medical emergency. You go to your parish priest, bring the a letter from the hospital that says this is the medical emergency, this is the cost, or bring the bill, write a covering letter that says to the parish priest, this is my financial situation at home, this is the struggles we are facing, maybe we have three lakhs in the bank, but if we re remove all that money, we'll have nothing to live on. So here's the honest truth, the surgery costs two lakhs, three lakhs, ten lakhs, whatever the case may be, give it to the parish priest. The parish priest, now listen to this. The parish priest will take it to a committee, um, should take it to a committee. They will check the papers. And the idea was that immediately, immediately, not you come after one week, you come after one month, immediately sanctions a sum of money. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Supposing as a parish priest, I give one lakh. 
Then I send all this paperwork that I've received. I give one lakh in, in check, not in cash, in check. I take all this paperwork, I send it to the bishop's house. And from that fund that Bishop Percy has collected, if I've given one lakh, they send me 50,000 back. So if earlier I could afford to give 25,000, I can now as parish priest give 50,000 because I know irrespective, if my paperwork is in order, I get a refund for our church. So we give more and therefore it's not the parish that's only giving, but it is the bishop's house that is also giving. The pastoral care comes from also the top. Part two, if supposing a bill was five lakhs, the parish can give one lakh. I would then take all the papers, original receipts, all the papers, write a covering letter to the bishop's house and say, Dear Bishop Percy, I have given from the parish one lakh, the total is five lakhs, this family cannot afford, they need another two and a half lakhs or so because they've collected only this much, they need two and a half lakhs. I write a recommendation letter and send it to the bishop's house. They go through it, make sure all the paperwork is in order. I know that in two cases they sanction more than five lakhs each. Now, of course, remember that they are distributing money the whole year through. So those days of giving those very large amounts have gone, but they give. Even quite recently, uh, somebody I know got a lakh and a half because I intervened. And here's the strange thing. I intervened and I wrote that they approached their own parish. Their own parish did not give it. So I am intervening on behalf of this family and the bishop's house still give the money. So when you are told this lie that the church is not giving, the church doesn't care, Ask the person, have you gone and approached the church with the right documents? Yeah, Because if you come with a, with a look of sadness on your face and no paperwork, I can't assist you. I can assist you if you are a Catholic, if you are from the Archdiocese of Bombay, please listen to that. If I'm a Catholic, if I'm in an Archdiocese, you'll say, Father, are we not giving non-Catholics? St. Michael's, Mount Mary's, all help people. But this fund is for Catholics only. So coming back. There are two choices. I throw my hands up and say, I can't do anything, or you become a Bishop Percy. And I've taken this trouble to explain this to you because I believe this is sometimes the best kept secret. Because a lot of people, I hope I've not got anything technically wrong. I sometimes get hauled over the coals by my own priests because I made a technical mistake. Yeah, I think sometimes they forget to see my intention, not making an excuse for the fact that I should not be technically right also. Uh, but the intention is to communicate that we as a church cannot throw our hands up because there are people, we have a choice of making a difference. Bishop Percy has made a huge difference and God bless him. I cannot say this again and again. God bless this good and holy man. Yeah, And I say this with great pride that I was baptized by Bishop Percy. It was he who came back as a parish priest to St. Ignatius Jacob Circle and gave me my first communion. And when I took over as parish priest in St. Jude's Maladies, he was the one who installed me as parish priest. I hope if I die before him, he will be the one to bury me also. Yeah, that would be my great privilege because this is a good and holy bishop who <laughs> yeah, has worked extremely hard. And if one bishop can make such a huge difference Imagine how every priest, every nun and all of you as lay people can make a difference. The fact is we don't want to. We want to curse the darkness, but we do not want to light a candle. And Jesus shows us the way. He tells Andrew and Philip, stop throwing your hands up. What do you have? At least come to me with what you have. And Andrew brings five loaves and two fish and says, what are we going to do? Philip looks at Jesus and says, I'm the accountant, you're not going to even feed one person. What does Jesus do? He takes all their negativity and throws it into the dustbin and works a miracle for all of us. Believe in Jesus Christ. Thank you. I hope I didn't lecture you more than I should. Don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and share the good news of the love of the church in Bombay for the poorest of the poor. We love, the church. We love our poor. Very often the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing and Catholics continue to talk half-truths. Yeah, I was going to use a stronger word, but half-truths. Don't, don't share half-truths. Yeah, so you'd like to give, you can give to Bishop Percy's fund, write directly to him 
I don't know the details, but you can contact him and say, I want to give towards this great fund, and you should give, or towards our home in, um, in Nuwe. Yeah? Always remember, God loves a gen generous giver. That's from scripture. And secondly, remember, when you die, you take your money to your grave. Use it to bring life to people while you are alive. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow uh, at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock is with me, Father Warner.